let's finish up with a look at triple negative breast cancer and hopefully some soon to come changes in our uh, clinical practice, hopefully. So why don't you give us an update in Passion 130, again, hit the, hit the New England Journal of Medicine in, in October, was it, right? That's ESMO? correct. At the ESMO meeting, uh, Peter Schmidt presented in Passion 130. This is a study of NAB paclitaxel with either a tezolizumab, a pdl one directed antibody, or a placebo in women uh, receiving first-line therapy for metastatic triple negative breast cancer. Um, the population was notable for a few different reasons, one of which is that 40% were uh, treatment naive, so de novo disease, so a mm. higher population mm. of de novo disease than one might normally expect in their own practice. Um, and 40% of the patients were pdl one positive by the uh, Ventana assay that they used, and that um, directly impacts the interpretation of the results. So 902 women randomized. They had two co-primary endpoints, progression-free survival and overall survival, both in the intention to treat population and in the pdl one population. So that was a um, pre-planned analysis to look in the pdl one positive specifically. Um, the results were impressive, at least to my mind. So the hazard ratio for the intention to treat population for progression-free survival was 0.8 in the PDL1 population for progression-free survival was 0.6, so a 40% reduction, um, which was impressive. Uh, the overall survival benefit was almost four months in the intention to treat population, but it was not statistically significant. The, um, the, the pre-planned statistical analysis was a hierarchical analysis, and they were supposed to meet the uh, statistical significance for the intention to treat population before looking at the PDL1 population for overall survival. So because the survival benefit seen in the intention to treat population was not significant, they were not able to do formal testing. However, that being said, the improvement in overall survival in the pdl one positive subset was 9.5 months, which is unprecedented, mm -hmm. really. So really represents mm -hmm. incredible um, innovation in otherwise um, aggressive, devastating disease. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. really thrilling to see um, a survival impact. Mm -hmm. So yeah, really, really mm -hmm. practice changing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, awesome, awesome. And I think, again, unexpected. Mm -hmm. I don't think, I think we, I think, again, maybe I'm the skeptic here, but I didn't think it was going to be that good. I really thought that maybe we'd see kind of a PFS benefit of some sort. You know, maybe longer in the PD-1 population, but no real OS benefits like we're seeing now. You know, I think it's being driven by that PD-1 population. It definitely driven by the pdl one positive population, and I think there's something to be learned here about how we interpret studies in this space, that maybe the rules that we've applied for cytotoxics don't apply here, because if the primary endpoint had been PFS alone, that may not have been as impactful. The fact that a co-primary endpoint of overall survival was chosen, I think, was what really drove home that um, so, so Heather, I, I, I guess one of my things, in the pdl one positive group, uh, explain to me why the progression-free survival was only improved by about two and a half months, but the overall survival was so markedly improved. Can you explain that at all? I just, I don't, I just don't really understand. Uh, I don't. <laughs> yeah, maybe you can. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, we've seen this across tumor types, and I'm not sure that we really have a cohesive reason for that. And so it's, it's really maybe about how the, the responders respond. Yeah. Yeah. And when you actually can generate tumor-specific immune memory, that it's durable, but it might not translate into progression by mm -hmm. historical definitions. Mm -hmm. So this is really something that we've struggled with across tumor types. And I... And, and we're revisiting applying the best possible benchmarks for evaluating these therapies. Because again, if we had only chosen progression-free survival to evaluate these strategies, we wouldn't be exploring these further and would have represented a lost opportunity. Big time. So definitely, you know, like, like so many other things, you, you have to have the right patient population. You gotta select for pdl one positivity. So as soon as FDA expands the label and adds the atezolizumab and napaclitaxel to the label, you know, we'll be all ready to go. So how do we find those patients? What are the subset analyses show, you know, with regard to immune cells, 
tumor positive cells, you know, what's the definition of PDL1? Are we supposed to use a particular antibody or how are we going to find these ones? So there are multiple antibodies in the market and different uh, sponsors have used different antibodies here. It was the Vantana antibody that was used. Um, it is yet to be determined whether the FDA will um, decide on a companion diagnostic as part of the label for, for this indication. Um, yeah, Leisha Emmons presented at this meeting some interesting biomarker analyses from these studies. Um, they looked at TILs by HNE, so tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, which have previously um, been very powerful in predicting for responses to checkpoint blockade strategies, but also conventional strategies, chemotherapy, trastuzumab. So that's been um, useful or uh, in other settings. So they looked at TILs by HNE. They looked at CD8 positive cells, so a specific kind of um, T cell population by IHC. And they looked at BRCA mutation status as well, because the idea is that if you have more DNA damage, you're more likely to have more neoantigens and therefore more information for the immune cells to respond to. Um, so the bottom line was really that PDL1 really negated the impact of any of those other factors. Mm -hmm. um, that um, for those who had BRCA mutations, they also had PDL1 positive tumors as well. Um, and um, CD8 positive as well, also had PDL1 positivity of, of immune cells. So PDL1 positivity really seemed to dominate um, and be the best predictor of responses. Um, and to your prior question about what assay to use and what cells to look mm -hmm. at, mm -hmm. Um, only 9% of tumor cells had PDL1. Um, 9%. Whereas, um, mm. as I said, 40% were PDL1 positive in the immune cells. So mm. it really seems to be driven by the immune cell PDL1 status rather than the tumor cell PDL1 status. Um, and I, th I think that we will probably um, be establishing guidelines based on immune cells alone rather than incorporating tumor cells. And actually, Alicia Emmons looked at that impact of the tumor cell um, um, PDL1 status and the immune cell PDL1 status. And again, the immune cell PDL1 status really overshadowed the Wait, tumor cell. So it was cell. a clean answer. Exactly. Was it, it was a clean, clean answer. For once, it was yeah, a clean, clean answer. answer. <laughs> Yay. Yes. But I think that's going to be new because it's mostly tumor cell PDL1 that's looked at in other malignancies. Mm -hmm. So I think this might be the first time that it'll be immune cells. So that'll just require some changing of the pathology methodology. You know, but we'll, we'll wait for the FDA guidance on that, certainly. But it's got to be about um, immune cells. Am I right that in the BRCA1-2 population, that it was about half PDL1 positive and half PDL1 negative. But it was a small I, amount. It was only like seven percent. Small numbers. Seven or ten percent were both. It was yes, something like yeah. that, right? Yeah. Remember, it wasn't. It wasn't a hundred percent. No, you know, absolutely 100%, not. You know, but it was. Um, so that's super important. And then we're going to hopefully get some preoperative data mm -hmm. coming out in the not too distant future in the triple hopefully, negative. Hopefully at ASCO. We're hopefully hoping ASCO. for uh, neoadjuvant data from um, the Impassion 130 study looking at chemotherapy, anthracycline taxane based chemotherapy with or without atezolizumab. And we're also hoping to get the Keynote 522 data, which is neoadjuvant, again, anthracycline taxane with or without pembrolizumab. So I think in six months' time, we'll actually have a pretty rich set of information. And I think we'll be able to um, enrich our understanding of this PDL1 question yeah. and best assay. Awesome. That'll be you know, yeah. upon us very, very soon.